Merry Christmas. Turn to the person next to you and say, Merry Christmas. Say, it's official. Now you can say it. It's December. I know a lot of you have been playing Christmas music since July, but it is now Christmas season. And we are starting a little mini series called Christmas Is. And I'm, I'm, I'm really excited because today's message is about the proclamation to the most unlikely group of people that you would ever choose to announce the birth of the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, the King of Kings, God who became human flesh, the least likely people that would be the first recipients are the ones who get the good news of great joy that'll be for all people. So how many of you need some good news today? How many of you really, be honest, how many of you could use some good news? Yeah? I mean, if we're honest, don't you love, if you, like if you're having a terrible day and then all of a sudden you get a call or somebody, you know, sends you a text or something and you get good news, it can literally flip the trajectory of your entire day. My husband, Eric, used to say, um, anytime he had good news, he would always say, so I have good news and I have bad news. Which one do you want to hear first? And if I said, I want to hear the bad news first, he'd say, well, the bad news is there's no bad news. So here's the good news. I led so-and-so to Christ today. And then if he'd ask me and I'd say, well, I want to hear the good news first, he'd go, well, the good news is there's no bad news. And here's the good news. And I got a raise. Or, you know, he'd say something. He would always mess with me that way. But I loved it whenever he would say that to me because I knew that what was about to follow was going to be significant. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We are going to talk about good news. Anybody else excited for that? Anybody want some good news? It's about time, right? Has anybody enjoyed this whole pandemic thing? Anybody just like, wow, this is, I'm living the dream. This is, <laughs> I actually had a couple of introverts admit first service that they, they actually like the, they like the whole social distancing thing, <laughs> which I think is a sickness, but um, anyway, <laughs> but so today we're going to talk about good news. And so the people that, that were literally the least likely to get this message were the guys who were hanging out in the fields, keeping watch of their flocks at night. It was the shepherds. Now, if you think about it, our God is a God of paradox, is he not? Um, Somebody told me that, you know, we say that God flips everything upside down, but actually what happens is everything is, oh, hi, Siri. That's who told me. Um, Flips everything upside down. Okay, be quiet. Oh my goodness. I guess you're going to see my flesh in a minute here. God doesn't turn uh, things upside down. He turns them right side up. Yeah? But God is a God of paradox. I mean, he's the one who said, if you want to save your life, you'll lose it. He says, give, and it'll be given to you. He's the one who came to these guys who were homeless and hardworking and uneducated. A lot of scholars say they were probably between 15 and 17 years old. They were considered unclean. Like people couldn't touch them or come near them because they were full of um, sheep droppings. That's a nice word, droppings. And they were the kind of people that, that were really considered kind of outcasts. They had to live outside of the city. They couldn't, I mean, they were just literally like the, the, the lowest rung on the totem pole. Have any of you seen um, the Chosen Christmas special? please go see it. Did you love it? Yeah, it's, that's what did it for me. That just kicked it off Christmas for me. It's beautifully done, but they do this portrayal. They, they, they do a beautiful rendition of the birth of Christ um, and just kind of everything surrounding that, and it's really realistic. But the, the whole part about the shepherds, I mean, you see that these shepherds are as, as one guy says, you know, it's a dirty job, but somebody had to do it. So the shepherds had three jobs. They were to protect, they were to care for, 
and they were to be like midwives or mid-husbands, I guess, but they were to birth the little lambs, the baby lambs. And what was interesting about the shepherds is that the, the priests would actually give the shepherds the linen cloths that they would wrap the little lamb in. But the, they gave the cloths to Mary, and she wrapped the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. Remember Elijah, or um, John the Baptist said, behold, when he saw Jesus, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. And so there's a whole period. So the book of Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. And then Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. So there are two Testaments in the Bible, and they're disproportionate. So it's not like half and half. It's like the Old Testament's way longer. But in between, the Old Testament and the New Testament is called the intertestamental period. We're going to talk about that more extensively next week. But that was a period of 400 years where God had not spoken to his people. 400 years people had not heard from the Lord. And it was a really dark time in history. And that's when a lot of the factions began to take place. And so here it is talking about night. So here, if you start in Luke chapter 2, um, verse 8, it says in the same region, which is basically talking about an agricultural area, it says shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night. Keep this in mind. It's pitch black. They didn't have their, you know, their phones to light up. It was pitch black. And now you think about it. Shepherds probably weren't able to rest very much either because, you know, sheep are dumb and sheep, you know, could wander off in the middle of the night and fall into a ravine and they'd have to go get them. Plus, they had to be very vigilant to protect the sheep from robbers or from, you know, being stupid themselves, you know, the sheep doing dumb things or having babies in the middle of the night. So the shepherds probably were sleep deprived too. And so they're sitting out there just you know, chilling, just kind of minding their own business. And it says in verse 9, now keep this in mind, 400 years they have not heard anything from the Lord. Some of you are feeling like it's been about 400 years since you've heard from the Lord too. But I want to tell you, God wants to give you good news today. God wants to speak some good news. God wants to speak some hope. This is the second week of Advent. Last week was, was the first week. And, and Advent, which means, it's a Latin word meaning coming, or the, the preparation for the coming of Christ. And the first week is hope. And that's really what our message is today. And then the second week is faith, and then love, and then peace. But I really believe that some of you today through this whole pandemic, through what has been a very dark and very hopeless season, we're going to see a switch. We're going to reframe this tragedy. We're going to reframe this dark time, and we're going to allow the light of Christ, the light of truth to come in and encourage us. Amen? And so, so here it says, an angel of the Lord stood before them. Okay, now, First of all, angels are not like these little cute, chubby little cherubs. Otherwise, they wouldn't have to say fear not every time someone encountered one, okay? Angels are massive. Like how many people are afraid of babies besides some of you single guys? <laughs> angels are massive. Angels are so scary. And, and you know, this is what I, I find really interesting so it says in Hebrews 1, it says that angels are ministering spirits that have come to serve us, even though we were made a little lower than the angels. Isn't that amazing? Again, the paradox of God, the greatest among you will be the servant. So even though we're made a little lower than angels, angels do minister to us. There is a case to be made for actual angels, not the little fat chubby ones, but actual angels. And here's one of them. This... I mean, 400 years they've heard nothing, and suddenly it says an angel of the Lord stood before him, and the glory 
of the Lord shone around them. Now, the glory of the Lord is like the most magnificent thing you can fathom in this earth. It's the most brilliant, fabulous, wonderful thing you can imagine. Here, God chooses the lowly shepherds to reveal his best stuff. Isn't that just so classic, God? He just does not do things the way we think sometimes. I mean, if I was, if I was, sorry, this is not heresy, but if I was the king of the universe or queen of the universe and I was going to come down, I would have like a major party, wouldn't you? But no, single angel comes down to the lowly, homeless, dirty, filthy, low, um, outcast shepherds. And they get to see the glory of God. Ah, I'm jealous. Aren't you jealous? Can you even imagine? And it says the glory, the doxa, the, the, the magnificence of the Lord shone around them. And how do they respond? It says that they were terrified. Ha, duh. The original language actually says megas phobeos, mega terrified. They were mega terrified. So that's why, that, that's why you know it was not little, some little cherub. So this massive angel comes and it said to them, verse 10, don't be afraid. You know, every single time people run into an angel, it's like the angel has to go, okay, just chill out. Chill. It's okay. Don't be afraid. So the angel says, don't be afraid for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. This good news is you angelezo, which means like the, the most amazing news you can hear. This is, this is actually where the word evangelist came from. Now, let me just clarify. An evangelist just simply means someone who brings good news. It's not like a guy with a greasy comb over and like a polyester suit on TV. That is not really what an evangelist is. It's somebody who's bringing good news. This is what we are called to be. We are called to be the people that bring good news. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But I want to give you some promises from the Lord. I want to give you some good news to remind you that you can overcome all of these things that have held you back or that have hurt you or broken you. And the first one, and I think this is one of the most common, um, the, the most common problems that people have, and that is the problem of fear. Fear. And you think about what's happening right now in our culture. People are mega terrified, aren't they? They're afraid of losing their job afraid of getting COVID, afraid of losing a loved one, afraid of their relationships ending because they can't get on the same page politically. I mean, there's a lot of fear surrounding what's going on right now. Yes? And yet, the Lord says, Isaiah 41.10, do not fear. Why? I'm with you. Do not be afraid. He has to repeat it. Do not be afraid, for I am your what? I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. All of the following verses that I'm going to give you, there, a lot of them are really common, and if you've been a Christian for a period of time, you've probably heard them, but these are all verses you should, you should put in your heart. You should memorize these verses, because then in... In times of trouble, you can quote this. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I, you know, you can, you can get into that situation. The Bible, you know, I talk about reading the Bible all the time, but I want to let you know the Bible is not for education. It is for transformation. Hello? It is not for education. It's not just to know a bunch of stuff. I have met so many people in my life who know the Bible backwards and forwards, like the back of their head, like my husband used to say. They know the Bible, but they don't live it. They don't love. You guys know people like that? 
I don't care how many verses you can quote. If you don't love people, if you don't demonstrate that you're, you're being transformed when you read the Bible, it's, it's useless. Like, the, like it says in 1 Corinthians, it's like a, a gong. And that's the thing. Reading the Bible, putting the word into your heart so that when you are going through a hard time, you can pull it out. You invest it in your heart so that you can withdraw it when you need it. You know, I had a situation, well, I'll get into this a little bit later. Oh, actually, that's my next point, anxiety. <laughs> that's your jam. <laughs> Somebody's like, I'm going to own it. <laughs> we are, I, I, I mentioned this last week, we are as a culture addicted to worry, are we not? We, we somehow feel obligated, like as if worrying about it is going to do something, Right? Worrying does nothing except keep you awake or raise your blood pressure or cause cortisol or all the things. Worrying is not from the Lord. And I just want to speak this to whomever needs to hear this. You do not have to live in anxiety. You do not have to live an anxious life. It says, Philippians 4, 6, this is one of my favorite passages, and I quote this back to the Lord all the time. I'm going to read it out of the um, Christian Standard Bible. It says, don't worry about what? What? Don't worry about anything? Come on. There's some things I need to worry about, right? Like my job or my relationships or my money or my health. Do I need to worry? I mean, if, if you really look at this, really break it down, if the Lord is saying, do not worry, then that means that, that it's possible to live a life free of anxiety. And I can promise you, I used to be addicted to anxiety. I used to, I used to be one of those people that would be awake at night just consumed with anxiety. And the Holy Spirit delivered me and you can be delivered too. Not that I don't, you know, have times, because I had, I had a situation happen on Friday, and I was consumed at the time with some anxiety. And I felt really helpless, and I didn't know what to do. And I just went out, and I walked, and I just quoted this whole passage out of Philippians 4. It says, have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving in your heart, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, that goes beyond our understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. See, this is what I'm saying. When you memorize the Bible, then when you are desperate, it will come out of you, and it will transform you. It will change the way you think. It will change your worldview. It will change the way you behave. But again, it's not just to, to know what it says, but it's to be transformed by it, to allow the Holy Spirit to change you in the midst of it. Do not worry about anything. This is one of the things that really set me free from anxiety. I actually started to see it as sin. Ooh, I just felt that. It is sin. And the, and the thing that the Lord showed me was that in the same way, if I were to have a lustful thought or a murderous thought or a thought of jealousy or coveting or whatever, I would kick it out of my brain. And in the same way, we are called to take our thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. If he commands that you don't have to be anxious, guess what? You don't have to be anxious. You can take your thoughts captive and surrender it to the Lord, casting your cares on him because he cares for you, confessing it to someone else so you can bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Amen? Does anybody have hope about this? Do any of you feel like there's no way I can never get set free from anxiety? Because I'm telling you, you can. The Lord is good and he wants to set you free. The third thing is idolatry or, or bondage. You know, idolatry, what an idol is, is it's anything that you set up above God. It's anything you think of most. That is your idol. That is what you bow down to. 
It can be a relationship. It can be money. It can be um, status. It doesn't have to be a, a wicked thing. It can be anything that takes away from the glory of God. And this is what the Lord says. I'm the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have other gods besides me. And now we kind of always think, well, I mean, I don't bow down to statues. That's weird. But we do bow down to other things, don't we? Sometimes our relationships. Or if you're not married, maybe you kind of idolize the idea of getting married and you think, wow, if only I got married, then I would be so happy. And then the married people think, if, no, never mind. I won't go there. <laughs> The next one is loneliness. You know, we live in a society now where there are more people, more single individuals living in a home than there are more than one person in a home. The single family home has surpassed the multiple family home. Isn't that crazy? People are just on their own. And you know, studies have shown that Gen Z is having less sex now. Not that that's a good thing. It's not a good thing. <laughs> I mean, it is a good thing. Okay, that's yeah, a good thing. But it's because they're doing it on their own. Just them and their phone, them and their laptop. It's tragic. And so then what happens is then when they get into a relationship that, that, that is meant to bless them, where they're, where they're supposed to have this gift from God, and yes, I'm talking about sex in church. This gift from God, they can't connect. They don't know how to connect because of some chemical responses. And it's tragic. These are idols. And the Lord is saying, you can be free. He's saying, you can be free. And you don't have to be lonely. You don't have to be lonely. Here he says in Hebrews 13, 5, keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For he, God himself, has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. Let me tell you guys, I, you know, after my husband passed away, and, and please hear me, I'm not saying this like for a pity party or anything. I'm just telling you, I suffered. I suffered. I was talking with last night with a, a woman who, um, her husband was a pastor. They were co-pastors, and he died of COVID. And she's trying to make some decisions if she should take over the church or not. And I was having a conversation with her, and, and I just said, because it's very recent, and I just said, you know, my word for that year, the year my husband died, was excruciating. But let me tell you, the relationship that I had with the Lord during that time, priceless. I would not trade it for anything. I mean, I saturated myself in the Psalms, and I was so intimate with the Lord. It was like I sensed his presence. It was constantly palatable, as much pain as I was in. And this is a thing. This is why you don't need to be afraid, because he is with you. You are never alone. He is there. He is for you. And, and you know, the thing is, when I wake up in the morning and I, I sit in my chair and I look up, it says in, in Psalm 90, it talks about the craftsmanship, or eight, maybe it's 86, talks about how the heavens are his craftsmanship. But to sit in his presence and to know, to sense that you are not alone, and he will never leave you. He will never reject you. He will never forsake you. Which leads to the next one, depression. You know, we live in a culture now where so many people are on antidepressants, and I'm not casting aspersions, but it says here, it says that we will suffer. First Peter 4.13, it's, it's talking about the suffering. And it says, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ. So in other words, it's saying, if you're suffering for the sake of Jesus or, the, or suffering for the sake of your faith, not just for stupid mistakes that you've made, because we, 
we do have natural consequences as well, right? Yes? Anybody ever had a natural consequence? But it says, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory, doxa, is revealed. It's saying that you are going to suffer, but you are going to be so, you are going to be so keenly aware that you're not doing it by yourself, that you have the Lord right there with you. Rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ so you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. The next thing is bitterness. This is one of the main things that I think holds Christians back from being free is unforgiveness, bitterness. Do you know that when I type in the word unforgiveness on my phone, it underlines it as though it was misspelled, as if there's no such thing? But bitterness is very real, is it not? And you've seen people who are consumed with bitterness, right? Don't be that guy. Don't be that person. You know, Jesus gives us the ability to forgive. Jesus actually gives us the ability to forgive. And here's what he says in Luke 637, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. And here it is. This is a command. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Now, I know there are those of you right now, and there's somebody in your brain, and you're like, nope. I can't forgive that person. You can. And you need to do it for your sake, for your sake not for theirs, not because what they did wasn't horrible, not because you weren't traumatized, not because what they did was not evil, but so that you can be free. See, forgiveness is not about the other person. It's about you not being bound to that person because they still own part of you when you're bitter against somebody. And again, you can take your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. And you can forgive. And if you need somebody to help you walk through that, we have a, we have like this program that we do and it's called the Steps to Freedom in Christ. And we would love to be able to walk with you. If you just feel like you're consumed with bitterness or you're consumed with unforgiveness, we would love to be able to walk with you and see you get set free. But it is possible to forgive. And I know that the Lord will give you the supernatural ability. Once you make the decision, once you say, I forgive, I forgive so-and-so for whatever it was because it made me feel like, and let yourself go there emotionally. Let yourself feel all the feels because that's when you really recognize what you're forgiving. You're giving up. Forgiving means giving up the right to demand something from someone. And when you stand before God, he says, forgive, and you'll be forgiven. I know this is hard. You know, I want to talk to you guys today about um, the lie of the secular culture. It'll only take me like three or four hours, so don't worry. <laughs> Just wrapping it up. Um <clears throat> You know, there is a lie that our culture has fed us. You know, we are an affluent nation, yes? I mean, in the West, we, are, we have bought into this lie that if religion was moved out of the way, this is what the secular mantra is. Secular just means not spiritual, okay? That if, if there was no religion, things would be much better. Isn't that kind of what the attitude is among the non-believing culture? That religion just kind of messes everything up. And so we bought into this lie that we could have one foot in the world and have it all and one foot in the church when Jesus calls us to lay down our lives for the sake of the kingdom. And what's happening now is that people, people thought for years, I mean, it's been probably, I don't know, 
40 or 50 years since they removed the Bible from school. You can't have a Bible in school or you, you can't use it or you don't pray. They didn't pray in school. It's taking, it's taking God out. And what's happening now is that the culture is imploding on itself because people thought for a while, well, if I had more information, if I had more knowledge, then I would be happy. It's like you can Google anything. You can find, I mean, a lot of it's false, but you can find any information, right? Is information satisfying anybody? I mean, I, I, we talked about the, the sexual malfunction of, of what's happening in our culture. So many people are addicted to porn. Is that satisfying anybody? Is anybody satisfied with that? No. How about affluence? I mean, I used to work at a resort that had wealthy people, and I really believe they were the most disillusioned people because they're like, wait, I'm rich and I'm still miserable. Like, how did that happen? Our culture, it's like, it's almost like Satan overplayed his hand. And now, I've been listening to this guy named Mark Sayers. He's a pastor and an author from Australia. If you can listen to anything by him, he is a brilliant man. And he said that he used to believe that the church was just going to die. But he said he went through this transformation in his own life, and he said that he started to reframe it and to see that what is happening is that Jesus is behind the transformation in our culture, that Jesus is allowing the lies of the secular world to fall in on themselves so that we can present the truth. This is the failure of the secularist culture. It's not working for people. And the thing is, when you have more freedom, you have less meaning. When there's something that you're fighting for, you feel a sense of purpose, don't you? You feel a sense of meaning. But people don't have meaning anymore. And this is what God wants to do in us. This is what he says, Psalm 138.8. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. I'm going to say that again. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. You were created for something more. Do you feel that? Do you believe that? You were not created to just survive. You were not created to just get through the day. You were created to, to thrive and to live a life of purpose for the sake of the kingdom. You know, one of the prayers I've been praying is, Lord, send me people who are hungry for you so that I can share the light of the truth. This is what he says. He says, <clears throat> the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Lord, your faithful love endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. This is the prayer of his heart. He's saying, Lord, let me see my purpose. Let me see who you've called me to be. Reveal to me who I was called to be. And here's the thing. We have the truth, the, the evangelizo. It's the, it's the good news for a dying world, for a hopeless world, for a world that is consumed with fear and anxiety and idolatry and loneliness and depression and bitterness and hopelessness. We actually have the truth. Jesus said of himself, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And we have that message. We are called to live lives of purpose and meaning. Does anybody need to hear this right now? We can flip this whole thing. This whole, I mean, so many people are like, I've talked to so many pastors and, and they feel like they failed and they feel like they just want to quit and they wonder what they've done wrong because of, you know, just the devastation that COVID has brought to the church. But cult cultural Christianity isn't going to make it anymore. If you're just a, a Christian in name only, and you aren't transformed by the Holy Spirit and by the word of God, things are going to get rough. God is calling us to lay down our lives and to live the lives of purpose that he's calling us to because we do have the real story. Isaiah 42, 6. I'm the Lord. I have called you for a righteous 
purpose. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's called you to a righteous purpose. And here he's saying, not only have I called you, I'm not just like sending you out. Okay, go figure it out. He's saying, I will hold your hand. I will actually walk with you while you walk in the spirit. He's saying, I will hold you by your hand. I'll watch over you. I'll protect you. And he's saying, and I will appoint you to be a covenant for the people. And here it is. And a light to the nations. Nations means people groups, different cultures. He's called us to be the light. This is the purpose. This is why we're, we don't come to Jesus and go right to heaven, because he wants us to live lives of purpose for his sake. Do you feel that? Yeah? Do you want that? Or do you want to just go to work and go home and binge watch Netflix and get up the next day and do it all again? <laughs> we have one honest guy in the room. <laughs> I know, you, I know we're tired. I know we get tired. And grief makes us tired, actually. But honestly, God has called you to a higher purpose. And even in the midst of suffering, he is with you. And he's going to instruct you and teach you the way you should go. He's going to uphold you with his righteous right hand. You know, the thing is that, that the pandemic kind of pruned the church in a good way, in a healthy way, because now there's a remnant. And, and the, Mark Sayers says that throughout church history, whenever they were writing the epitaph for the church, God was poised to bring a revival. And what revival means is re, means again, vive, means to live. How many of you want to live again? How many of you are sick to death of the enemy winning this whole battle with the pandemic? Amen? We are called to live. We're called to reframe this whole devastation and say, no, Satan overplayed his hand. He is not going to win this one. You know, like they say, I've read the end of the book and we win. Amen? We are called to live lives of victory. Yeah? But here's what's the problem. Here's the problem. There's a mainframe somewhere in the Silicon Valley that has all of the information about you on it. Everything. There's a guy who is an information technology specialist, and he said you would be terrified if you, you'd be mega terrified if you knew what they know about you. They know what times of the day you're most depressed. They know... They know your weaknesses because of emails, the words that you use in your emails. They know the things you're afraid of. They have this whole mainframe, and they've got all the information about you. And so you know what they do? Like during the election, they would figure out what time of the day people were most stressed out, and they would send them a scary political ad during that time. Have you ever been like talking about something, and then the next day, Boom, all the ads show up. Like, you know, you're talking, oh, talking about the Philippines, and we're going to go to the Philippines, and let's, you know, we've got a bunch of churches in the Philippines. All of a sudden, it's like, on my phone, it's like, flights to the Philippines. Is that not terrifying? But here's the thing. This is the prince of darkness trying to change you, trying to change your purpose, trying to change your worldview and your vantage point. We need to push back, remnant. We need to push back, believer, and say, no, I'm not buying into this. I'm not buying into these lies. I will not give in to fear. I will not be anxious. I will not bow down to idols. I will not allow myself to be lonely. I will be with people that encourage me. I will not give in. I will not. I'm going to push back against the schemes of the evil one. And let me just say, Jesus is coming back. Until I die, I am going to stand here. And one day I'm going to be right. <laughs> but he is coming back. And all the pastors that I talk, about, talk with, and I talk to a lot of pastors throughout the nation, and they all feel it something. 
Jesus is coming back soon. And it says in Philippians, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee will bow. That means, that means Muhammad will be bowing. Buddha will be bowing. LeBron James will be bowing. Sorry. Bowing before the king of the universe and confessing Jesus is Lord. And you have your choice. You can either be humbled or you can humble yourself. Because it's, it's no longer possible for us as believers to just live a lukewarm life. Things are speeding up. Things are increasing. There's the increase of wickedness. And I'm not trying to say this to scare you. I'm trying to say this to encourage you because we just read, it says 2 Timothy 1, he saved us. He called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Jesus Christ before time began. Have you ever been on a really long trip? Like say, for example, you're um, flying in and you've been on a flight for hours, or you're driving in, and all of a sudden you start to see things that are familiar. That feeling, ah, oh, I'm almost home. I'm almost home. I'm getting closer. That anticipation. That's what Jesus is calling us to. He's like, you're, you're getting there. It's getting closer. It's getting closer. And we have the opportunity to live lives of purpose and meaning and to say no to the things of this world and just say, God, I want to live for you. I want to live my whole life for you. Would you stand with me now? Do you want to do that? Do you want to reach your final destination and have the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant? Enter into the joy of the Lord. Or is he going to say to you, I didn't know you. I didn't know you. Those are the only two options. Would you mind holding your hands out just as a symbol that you want all that the Lord has for you? Father, we come before you. We come humbly. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who wants to give us good news. Lord, that you are a God who wants to speak promises to us, that we don't have to live in fear, that we don't have to be anxious. We don't have to worry. We don't have to bow down to idols that will not save us, God that we don't need to be lonely. You've given us a community and friends and family to be with, Lord. God, we don't have to live in depression and bitterness. But Jesus, you have called us to live lives of purpose, lives of meaning. And so, Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, God, we just surrender to you. Surrender to you. Surrender to your ways, Lord. We want to live lives of passion, for you. Lord, we don't want to just survive. We want to thrive in you. And so, Lord, I pray that who, whomever needs to commit themselves fully to you today would do that right now. And, and if that's you, just between you and your maker, can you just speak that to him? Just say, Lord, I give myself fully to you. I give myself fully to you. Thank you, Lord. Fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Make us the light in the dark world. Lord, this dark, dark world, make us the light. Let us live lives of purpose. If you have never said yes to Jesus, if you've never been born again, or you have never, never been forgiven for your sins, would you just raise your hand just between you and God? Everybody else, if you could just keep your eyes closed, just raise your hand between you and God that you want to be forgiven. You want to live forever in the kingdom of heaven with God? Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, Lord, make us bold witnesses. Make us evangelists, Lord. Make us people that bring the good news. Help us be bold. Lord, when Paul prayed, he prayed that, that he would be bold as he ought to. Lord, let us be bold. Let us share the good news at work, in our neighborhood, in our families, Lord. We just, we invite you, God. Fill us to overflowing so that we can shine bright for you, for your purpose. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Amen. Well, next week we are going to talk about great joy. And we're going to talk about, I'm, I'm going to kind of set it up with the history of what happened in between the Testaments. It's pretty interesting stuff. So go see the Chosen Christmas special. You will love it. And if you don't, um, money back guarantee. So <laughs> I love you all so much. See you next week. Thank <laughs> you.